So we're going to continue our uh, afternoon with uh, three more distinguished speakers and our, our continued theme of uh, risks and rewards will be uh, exemplified in the next lecture in terms of risks and rewards of not grafting. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Frank Renoir. Uh, he is a graduate of the Dental University of Paris and he is an assist was an assistant to Paul Tessier for a number of years on the Tessier uh, craniofacial surgery team, which is a very, those of you that are oral maxillofacial surgeons in the audience know what a prestigious event that is. He has written uh, several uh, textbooks. He's authored many papers and many chapters. One of his uh, more recent textbooks is very impressive because as we enter into this next uh, few years, uh, it becomes very clear that a lot of the problems that we have have a lot to do with not following uh, certain protocols. And his textbook, The Weakest Link, uh, compares uh, surgery and surgical work with a pilot who has a pilot checklist. And uh, so any of you that can get an opportunity to get that textbook and read it would find it very interesting. It's a real honor to have Dr. Renoir here to speak to us this afternoon on his uh, title of uh, Risk and Rewards of uh, Not Grafting. Doctor. Yes, please. Water, yes. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction and thanks obviously for the organizing committee and Peter uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk in this uh, very nice session. My dear colleague, I'm oral surgeon, but you know, I have an, several hobbies and one of these hobbies I love to do cooking. And uh, once per month I cook in a professional way, I have customers and people pay to enjoy my, my food and to improve this cooking and I visit some chief cook in Paris. I'm very happy to have some good friends who are chief cook and I try to learn how to be better in, uh, in cook. And I can tell you that I'm very serious. I spend half a day, I take notes, I take photographies, I, I try to do my best, and when I come back, come back home in my kitchen, most of the time the result is not what I've learned during the afternoon. That is the difference between the knowledge and the experience. It's the same in surgery. Sometimes, we try to improve, we visit experts in surgery, and we spend half a day, and we take photos, we ask all the questions, we take a lot of notes, and when we come back in our OR, we still have complications. And the lecture will, be, will use both some uh, the knowledge, which is very easy to share, to discuss, because it's, uh, something, uh, it's something objective, but also experience. Experience, to have experience you need time, and experience is very subjective. So I will use both knowledge and experience to try to talk about risk and rewards of non-grafting procedures. If we want to avoid bone graft in our practice, routine practice, we, can, we have different options. The first are short implants, narrow implants, tilted implant, we can use also zygomatic implants or we can uh, modify the prosthetic design. Because of my experience with a short implant, I work on that topic for more than 20 years. I will concentrate my talk on the short implants and at the end of this uh, lecture, I will give some word about a new fashion we have now in implant dentistry, which are the extra short implant. But before starting, I would like to say that short implant is not a sect. We can, for example, use in the same patient both bone graft and short implant. This patient had maxillary cancer. She had a maxillectomy and 
the maxillary was reconstructed by two step of bone graft, and finally, 18 years ago, I have placed three short implants on the left side, but you can see that on the right side, because I have plenty of bone, I have placed longer implant. In the same way, we can indic indicate on the same patient both short implant and long implant. This patient was treated a long time ago, more than 23 years ago now, and at that time sinus lifts were not so easy to use, and I have placed Kerrigan implants, the technique developed by one of my partners, Jean-Francois Tulan. Obviously, today I won't use the same treatment for his patient, but what I, I would like to say is we, we cannot make opposition between short implant and graft or short implant and other technique. We have a patient and we have to find the best way to treat this patient. And to summarize, we can say that probably we have a truth somewhere, but the biology is so complex that we must be very humble. We know very, very little in the bone biology around implants. And we are using the true. We, we believe the best for our patient according to our background, our experience. And even if there is a truth somewhere, but I'm not sure that today we have the ability to know the truth and we are most of the time trying to choose the best truth for our patient. And short implant and non-grafting procedure is part of the truth. And instead trying to convince you to use a short implant and telling you have to use short implant because I'd, I'm going to try to answer to the questions generally I receive when I lecture on the topic why we don't use short implant. And we have different questions. The first is about the poor survival rate. I don't like short implant because we have more failure with short implant compared with longer one. With um, um, David Nison, we have done several uh, literature review analysis, and the last one was published in 2014, in a period 2000, and we have analyzed a lot of paper, 22 case series, 32 case series devoted to short implant for RCT and 14 reviews. And to be very short and very rough, we can say that today, whatever the implant system you use, we have around 96% of survival rate with a short implant. And it's not very surprising, I just would like to remind you that the first implant placed by P.I. Branemark in 65 on this gentleman, the first implant was this one. I, I, I put this fixture into the bone. I put it just all the way down to the roof of the canal. It's very emotionally to listen P.I. Branemark talking about the first implant, and this X-ray was taken 40 years after loading. Short implant is not nothing new. The first implant developed by P.I. Branemark were very short implant, below seven millimeters. And then when the dentist has decided to take care of implantology, the things were changed. So obviously, we have failure with short implant. After 19 years, this implant becomes disintegrated, and I don't know why. The patient has no problem. She has only a problem with the vitamin D, but I don't know why. But we have also to admit that we have also problem with long implant. This implant was disintegrated after nine years. I don't know why. We must be very humble. We have some explanations, some hypotheses to explain this disintegration, but honestly, we don't know exactly why. Another patient treated in 99 and 2003, everything was perfect, and suddenly in 2008, the distal short implant was not integrated anymore. 
Okay, you take it out and you, re you replace, you can replace a new one. Obviously, with short implants, sometimes if you lose this implant and you lose bone at the same time, that could be impossible or difficult to replace a new implant. And each time I place a short implant and I continue to place a lot, I tell to the patient, okay, I'm going to place short implant because you have six millimeters below the sinus in my mouth or for my friend, even for Patrick Palassi, for example, I will place this short implant. But in case of failure, if you lose bone, obviously I will have to graft before, to, to replace a new one. It's a very clear in my mind, it's very clear in the patient mind, and also for the referrals, they receive a letter, so in case of failure, I will have to graft uh, to replace the implant. And my dear colleague, if, he, if we want to be very honest, we must not compare short implant we place in a, in a back versus long implant we place in the front, in the same physics, for example. And that is what we have in our mind. The short implant have a lower survival rate compared to what? If you want to be fair, you have to compare short implant in a posterior maxilla with longer implant placed in a graft. In a balance, when you make your decision, you have in one plate a short implant, in the second one, long implant, plus all the problems, complications, and failures you can get with a graft. At that time, you can compare in a safe way. And here you have four RCT. We have mentioned in our papers, and today we have more. And in the same mouth, on the one side, the surgeon have placed short implant. In the other side of the maxilla mandibles, they have placed longer implant plus a graft. And in all the studies we do have now, we have more or less the same survival rate when we talk about implants. But for each of the series, we always have more complications due to the graft. That means that if you trade, you, you have, for example, six millimeter of bone, you can place only short implant, you have 96% of result of success. You can place longer implant and bone graft, you have 96% of success, but you have also complication specifically due to the graft procedure. Another issue I very often listen when I talk about short implant is a famous pro biomechanical problem due to the ratio. Because the ratio, I have, I've listened a lecture some years ago in Italy, and the guy said, if I have more than 10 millimeters between the teeth and the crest, I graft to reduce the ratio. We have performed several uh, uh, finite element analysis in Paris with a professor Pierre Isnar. And it's not, now we do know that what is the, implant, the length of the implant, the stress is always concentrated around the first millimeters of the implant. And you can increase the length if you load your implant with a lateral load that won't change the stress distribution and the stress into your implant. And we have done another finite an analysis using extra short implant 4.5, medium implant and long implant 10 millimeters. On the top we have placed short abutment, long abutment, medium abutment, and you can see on this graph you have here short implant, long abutment, the bad ratio, 2 to 1. And you have more stress on your implant and if you look at only this figure, you can say, look at, the ratio is a problem. But now, look at, you have a 10 millimeter implant, 10 millimeter abutment, the ratio is one to one, and it's exactly the same. The problem is not the ratio. My dear colleague, the ratio does not exist. The ratio is a pure invention of the dentist. From mechanical point of view, the ratio does not exist. The problem is the length of the crown. What is the, the length of your implant? But if we are honest, we don't have any papers, any, nothing in literature, 
which clearly demonstrates that if you have a long Crohn, you have more problems and more complications. We do have now a lot of papers, a lot of literature review. This one was performed by Blindness in 2009 for the EU com consensus conference, and we have no, uh, 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 no difference between the different ratio if we consider the peri-implant bone level. Another, and you have a lot of papers, another one, it's about single crown and uh, zero to seven years, different ratio, no difference in terms of complications or mechanical complications. Another issue, peri-implantitis. I don't use short implant because if I have a bone loss because of peri-implantitis, I am going to lose the implant very quickly. Okay, that's right. I have short implant, I have a severe peri-implantitis, this implant are lost. I have short implant, I have bone loss, and 20 years later, it does not change. The big difference is on the left, you have a machine surface implant, on the right, raw surface implant. Maybe here is a difference. But do you think that the situation of this long implant is better than this one, which is shorter? We must be also very honest. Today, we have almost no treatment, efficient treatment for peri-implantitis. This patient is, um, has a severe periodontitis, is a diabetic, and four years after implant placement, he has developed a peri-implantitis. We have done two steps, two surgeries to try to clean, etc., and finally, the treatment was you know, to take out the implant. And you know what? I prefer to remove short implant instead long implant. It's easier, and you can have short or long implant. If you have a very severe peri-implantitis, fi finally the treatment will be the same. Another issue, short implants are difficult to place. They, they need a large experience, and that is what was written in this uh, conference, conf uh, European Consensus Conference, uh, published in the European Journal of Im Implant, uh, Implantology, 2011. Implant surgeon and restorative dentist should have adequate clinical core experience. Okay, two minutes about this topic. Thanks to Dreyfus and Dreyfus, these two guys are no dentists. They have worked for US Air Force, and they have analyzed how we get skilled. If you play tennis, you pilot uh, airplanes, you are a dentist or you are a cook, we always start to be novice, then beginner, competent, proficient, expert. And they also showed clearly that, in fact, most of the people stay at maximum at the level of competent. To become expert, you need a lot of time, a very specific engagement, specific motivation, and very few people go there. But now, if we analyze what is the level of skill do you need to play short implant, to do sinus lift, or to do vertical ridge augmentation? To play short implant, I do believe that you need a little experience. It's not for novice. When you are novice, you are blind, you follow stupid rules, you don't understand why, you just follow the rules you have, and when you become, uh, you go up in this scale, you work more with your, your intuition. At the beginning, it's short implant are a little bit difficult. It's difficult because difficult to get the good eyes axis the first time, difficult to get good primary stability. But let's say, if you have 30, 30, 40 implants behind you, you can play short implant. The sinus is another story. Most of the time, sinus are very easy, very nice. But when you have complications, that could be very tricky. And that time, you need experience. And uh, sometimes I see some colleagues who perform sinus, but we are not able to treat their complication by themselves. I think it's not very fair. And about vertical ridge augmentation, definitely it's a very tricky uh, uh, procedure. I don't want to say we, we must not perform vertical ridge augmentation, but if you do only 
two or three times per year, please forget it. Forget it. It's not for you. It's a difficult surgery, and you need to reproduce several times per month at least. And in the period 2000, we have written a paper with David, and I have written a long chapter on the new concept in implant dentistry, which is a stress minimizing surgery. We have to try to reduce the stress to be, to be concentrated during surgery. That is based on human factor concept. Perform, performing surgery requires knowing how to manage mental resources which are limited. What does that mean? That means that even if you are the best surgeon of the world, if you are tired, if you are stressed because you have a family problem, if you have a, a new assistant which is not very well trained uh, on your surgery, your resources, your ability to perform very nice surgery could be very low. And taking this example, if you climb on the top of this antenna to fix a problem, while you can do exactly the same, staying on the ground. I'm sorry, it's not very dip diplomatically correct to say, but you are stupid. <laughs> because going on the top of this antenna requires to have a specific mental resources. And another issue is if you make a mistake, if you make an error when you are there, the consequence can be dramatic. The same errors, if you are on the ground, the consequence could be zero. If I make an example very, very easy, you have to choose between short implant and sinus lift or vertical reach augmentation. And during the flap procedure, you make a perforation. That is an error. Everybody make errors, no discussion. It's not a problem. But the consequence, if you place short implants, it's nothing. If you try to make vertical regimentation with membrane, that could be a big issue. Dear colleague, errors reduce the safety margin. And we have to try always to choose the simplest procedure as possible. And if the simplest procedure is not a good indication, okay, let's imagine something more difficult, but always we have to try to choose the simplest procedure as possible. And the last of the, but not the least, why we don't use short implant? Because. Because of what? Because of because. That is a pure subjective assessment based on the cognitive bias. Cognitive bias are universal, systematic, and persistent. Let's say, I'm dentist, I place implants, I have done a very nice training postgraduate in America, and my, the director of the program uh, is um, a fantastic oral surgeon. He do love bone graft. And now I have to put in a balance, I have to choose for one of my patients between short implant or longer implant and bone graft. The first bias I have is what we call the force of habit. I am going always to choose the most familiar procedure, even if not the best available. And if my mentor, my, my director, to talk me about uh, bone graft and bone graft and bone graft all the time, because even if I know because I have the knowledge but I have not the experience, even if I know that short implant exists, I am going to choose the bone graft. The second bias is what we call the confirmation bias. Now, because I want to perform the, the sinus lift, I am going to look for only data which confirm, rather than challenge, my theory. I am looking for the problem with short implant, and I'm looking for only the advantage of the bone graft. And to do that, I am using a third bias, analytical bias. That means that I'm going to underestimate the risk. I am going to underestimate the risk of the bone graft, for example. And I love this sentence I found in a paper in medicine about 
influence of overconfidence of the medical errors. And the guy said, doctor thinks a lot of patients are cured who have simply quit in disgust. We must accept that it's very difficult to analyze its or her own practice. It's very subjective. And because of this bias, we always believe that what we want to do is easier, better, with a better result. But it's a no more, it's a, a no more way of thinking. And the last bias is a conformity bias. If the group I work with prefer to do a bone graft, I will be engaged to follow the decision of the group. And you can say, no, no, not me. I'm sorry, that is a bias. A bias, it's a way of thinking that is universal, systematic, and persistent. It's very difficult to fight. And if today I met the same patient, next Monday in my office, I have the same patient, I'm not sure that I will be so ready to, play, to treat this patient with a short implant even if I have, in this case, more than 18 years after loading. I know that works, but because the information we got now with vertical rejugmentation, with distraction, because etc., etc., even if I know that a short implant works, I'm not sure that I will use the same, uh, uh, the same protocol. We must be very, caref very careful with this bias. But if I want to convince you that short implant works, I would like to talk about um, a specific experience in France. In France, we have a small village in south of the country called Marseille. Marseille is a very small village. And the people who live in Marseille, called Marseillais, they are very strange. They don't speak French. They speak Marseillais. They don't eat like us. They, they eat a uh, um, bouillabaisse. They are strange. They don't drink wine. They drink pasties. If a Marseillais can get a nice resort with short implant, everybody in the world can get the same. <laughs> and this guy is Patrick Palassi. If Patrick is able to get, after 15 years, this fantastic resort, you can get also a good resort. It's a, obviously, it's a joke. We are friends, and we work together. And I believe that I have convinced Patrick to use short implant. But when we have worked together, he has convinced me to use narrow implant. And now you can redo the same lecture, and you change short implant but by narrow implants, and you will have exactly the same result. It's the same philosophy, the simplest as possible. And now I use more and more narrow implants, thanks to Patrick, and it is exactly the same. We have to decrease the morbidity of the treatment if we want to increase the number of patients we will treat. Finally, just some word about extra short implant. Extra short implant are implants below six millimeters. I have used this uh, implant long time ago, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, 12 years ago. The first was uh, for this patient. She has a severe TMG problem. And the orthodontist said, Frank, you have to place an implant. And honestly, I have no issue, no graft, nothing. And thanks to Borangert, who unfortunately passed away some years ago, and Nobel Biocare Company to have developed this prototype, I've installed this uh, extra short implant. And that is a result 10 years after loading. This implant is a 4.5 by 4.5. That was a prototype, only a, a, sing, a single piece. And we have treated several patients with a group in Europe with, let's say, pretty good result. And this patient was treated after seven years of loading. Obviously, we had also a problem complications. This patient was treated with a flapless surgery. These implants are not so easy to place. That is a result after provision, they are provisionalization and then a definitive that is um, six years. And unfortunately, very recently, more than 10 years after loading, the, the implant were disintegrated. The patient has lost her bridge in, his, in the 
other part and maxilla, maybe overload, maybe other um, reasons, I don't know. We must know that if we use X-ray short implant, we are going to have more failures. I estimate between 80 to 90% of success after 10 years. That is not uh, science, that is pure smell, pure experience. But I, I think that we will have between 90, 80, between 80 and 90% of results after 10 years. Also another issue is these implants are not so easy to place. You need a very nice indication. You, you must have a good experience because it's difficult to place, difficult to get the primary stability when you have only a four or five millimeter of bone. And um, the anatomy of, of the mandible of maxilla most of the time are not uh, excellent. These implants are a little bit difficult to place, but I think that we can treat uh, a lot of patients safely in a good way using this extra short implant. And the only problem is a problem of money, of the financial problem, because the patient pay for treatment. And if you have 80 or a percent of success, maybe that will be a problem. And the prosto team must develop a cheaper prosto uh, uh, in order to propose long-term provisionalization for this patient. To summarize, um, I don't use short implant or I try to use longer implant when, when I use machine implant in a soft bone, in a grafting material, in extra soft bone. And to summarize, in fact, in a low bone healing potential, a uh, concept I, we have defined with Borangert in a book in 99. So my dear colleague, I, I hope that I have convinced you, some of you, to use more short implant for benefit of your patient. I wish that you have enjoyed the uh, lecture. I wish that you are going to enjoy the meeting. And by experience, I can tell you to enjoy the life. Thank you very much.